Good morning, everybody. Should I not project my voice too loud? Have you all uh, had a, bit, a little bit uh, of a late night, or you're all okay? You've had enough coffees this morning to uh, be all pumped? Um, my name is Paul King. I probably know most of you, um, so I'm obviously involved a lot with Groovy. I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey on the uh, Groovy roadmap. Uh, just a quick advert first. There'll be a copy of Groovy in Action to give away in the uh, prize giving away session uh, later this afternoon. So I know you needed no motivation to hang around all day, but uh, there's just a tiny bit of uh, extra motivation. Um, let's get in and have a look at this. I've, this is a slide deck that actually will probably would take about uh, two hours to talk about all the details on all the uh, things that are in the, in the uh, 2.5 and future versions of Groovy. I'm going to be skimming over a, uh, some of the content, it just, it'll give you a flavour of some of the things that are there. I'll be trying to zoom in on what I think are the important things. So as I get to that, uh, we'll soon see. Um, if you haven't uh, spoken to the OCI people, I'm sure you've, you've uh, all been uh, chatting to the several of us who are here. Uh, by all means, come and see us. There's lots of stuff that OCI do outside of uh, Groovy and Grails and Micronaut, and uh, they can help you with whatever you're uh, after training and a bunch of other uh, areas that they've got plenty of expertise in. The little yellow dot is kind of where Brisbane is on in, in Australia, so that's uh, roughly where I come from. We're also uh, something that often doesn't get much focus uh, at uh, this conference is, is the Groovy's now a part of a big family in, in the Apache world, so you should... Uh, see if you can get to know that world a little bit better. I'm still getting to know that world. There are um, 200 million lines of code in the Apache projects. Uh, hundreds of, uh, th what is it, 350 plus projects. So there's a lot of stuff happening. There's 50 projects that are called podlings that are in the incubator. So there are 50 new things that you probably haven't heard about that are gonna be the next things that are, are, are coming in the camp. So I've, I'm keeping an eye on lots of this stuff and trying to work out how Groovy's going to fit in with a whole lot of technology that's emerging, but I'd encourage anyone else who's interested to, uh, to come along as well. There are some ApacheCon conferences, obviously not as important as the Great Conf here, of course. Um, there isn't a lot of Groovy content at those conferences yet. Um, I've, got, I've submitted some things. I don't know whether I'll even get accepted yet. We'll see what happens. But I'd encourage more people to uh, attend and submit talks into these conferences. So there's one in Berlin. Oh, the call for papers for these two is just both of them have just finished. But keep keep an eye out for down the down the track. If you've got if you're a regular speaker and you've got some canned talks, and there's a conference coming near near you, you should uh, and get some more groovy content into these uh, conferences. When I go and talk to many of these other projects, th and they can see how groovy can help and augment their projects, they kind of wow, look at this. This is really great. You're using um, groovy with my data science project and Look, you've only, you know, my, my Hello World example on my front page is 20 lines. You've got a Hello World in six lines in Groovy that doesn't even need any downloads or anything because it's got the grab. Wow, I, I should put that on my um, side and I'll attract more users to my technology. So there's a huge uh, role that you can play in just spreading the word in that community as well. So keep that in mind. So what is Groovy? We all know what Groovy is. It's like a super version of Java. But where should Groovy go to? Um, down the track. So Java's now a, a beast that's moving it a lot quicker than it did when Groovy was uh, instigated. So we, it's, it's worth, worth our while to have a bit of a think of how Groovy fits into the ecosystem we're in and, and how should we pos be positioning Groovy? How should we be evolving Groovy to, uh, so that it's around and we can enjoy it for uh, as long as possible? So I want to take us, to answer that question, that'll be right at the end of my talk, but to answer that, we need to kind of think about how it started in the first place, and I'll briefly look at that. Many of you will, will know some of this. I wasn't the um, person involved in the writing the very first uh, part of it, but I've been involved um, not too long since it's uh, been around. But at the time, there was a lot of these, you know, the cool kids were these Ruby on Rails people, and they were being super productive, and there was other people who were Python programmers or small talk programmers, and they could do things that we could do in Java, and we could do very efficiently in Java, but with a fair bit of uh, boilerplate code. So the idea was to create a scripting language, if you like, that would uh, bring in a, a whole bunch of ideas from uh, these other languages that had, were doing things very pr productively and making things fun and, and uh, 
how can we marry that up in a way that a Java program would be very familiar with it? Okay, we're not, we, don't want to we don't need to go and recreate Ruby or, or recreate Python, they're, they're there. But uh, as a Java programmer, if, if I could have some of those things, what would they look like? And, and uh, let's bring them all together. So, that, so that's the sort of inspiration. How do we, there's some pain points that if I'm trying to parse uh, work with files, parse XML, work with databases, some of this stuff, a lot of boilerplate code in, in Java at the time, and still is in some cases. So they're the pain points. How can we um, remove some of those pain points? So that, that was the inspiration. How do we uh, mix all those things together? We've got to work out how all those features interact in a good way and maintain the Java feel. So Java's always meant to have been a language that uh, people would be, feel comfortable moving between Groovy and Java and working well together. And so that was always part of the story. And I think that makes, still makes sense for us to do that. Um, when we're providing all these features to the users, there's a, a something that was part of um, many Lisp languages is the features that I need to build the language, I should make those available to my end users. So in Lisp, everything's just a data structure. And so if, if you don't like the way your Lisp program's been compiled, you can get look at the data structure of, of the, uh, the program and, and uh, manipulate it. And that's something that we've tried very hard to do in, in Groovy. So if, if we need a feature to do, um, a, you know, we, we're wanting to manipulate AST uh, structures, we open it up. So AST transforms allow you, everyone, all the user community to write AST transforms. The metaprogramming, open it up so that, so that you can manipulate the, uh, the, the Groovy run, uh, runtime facilities. So that's a, an ethos that we've always had, and we've got to maintain that as, as we uh, evolve the language. And the end result, it's, it's a, a language that allows you to be very productive and lets you get stuff done and it's fun, easy to learn. So that, that's how it all started. And at the end of the talk, we're going to come back and ask those questions again. What, how would we answer that going forward? Because if we try to be everything to everybody, if we try to be a, you know, every, if we have, what, try to have every feature that Scala or Kotlin's got and, but do better than them, we'll end up uh, not quite matching all of the criteria because we, we'll be, um, won't, we don't really have the, the resources to try to do that. So we should be focusing on the things that are important for us, the things that make the language productive and fun and all those things, and providing good solutions in other areas so that we're not falling behind the other languages, but we don't need to go and try to uh, beat them in the areas that, that, that they excel in. So we'll, we'll come back to that. So just want to get, before I go into um, sort of all the features, just quickly do a, an assessment of how, how Groovy's been sort of traveling. And if you look at the, um, the downloads, they're just skyrocketing out of, I, I don't understand how, why there's this many downloads. I guess all the CI servers in the world are now, have now got bits of Groovy running inside them and um, there's just more and more of them happening. There's bigger and bigger farms and, and, and the numbers are, uh, just keep boosting up. So I, um, I think, so, so there's a tweet for, uh, I think Guillaume might have put that out, May 6th. Groovy's had uh, more than 240 million downloads. Uh, if you looked, we'd, we'd only had um, half that sometime last year. And so it's just a huge increase and it's just uh, skyrocketing up. So that's really good. What about the number of commits? There's not as many people who are, have it as their day job to, to work on Groovy, but then we're, you know, we're, not, we're not quite um, at the peak of the language, but it's been pretty healthy right since the word go and it's, it's not really changing. What about number of contributors? Again, there's less, there's less bodies in terms of full-time bodies that are working on it, but since we moved to Apache, you can see the overall level in the first half of the language, it's, it's now double what it was for the first half of the language. So th that's a really good sign. Um, oh, the reason why the last thing's got a little sort of dotted line on it, I've only got the May, uh, up to April or May for some of these stats, and, and uh, by the end of these are all half-year stats. So um, by the end of June, I don't know what it's going to be, but I've sort of taken a guess based on the current monthly rate. Issues resolved. Again, it's um, pretty healthy with all these things. Uh, releases. Bit of a hiccup in this graph. I'll explain that. This, this is kind of the 
But there's, o there's over 200 artifacts in the Groovy build. And when we sort of joined Apache, they kind of said, oh, we've got this manual process where each artifact is manually signed by the user who's the release manager, and then it's voted on for three days. And then because you're in the incubator, then you've got to get a another team of people who are going to assess whether or not you're releasing things well, and they're going to vote on it for three days and, and so on for, for all 200 artifacts and sort of thing. No, 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 that's not going to work for us. And it took us quite a little while to... Um, we, we had a very, very highly automated uh, release process prior to that, and that wasn't going to work in the, the new Apache world where we needed uh, approvals and, and human, there's always human checks in the Apache world. But we don't want it to be super laborious, so we've now automated it, but it took us a little while to do that. And for a while after, after Pivotal um, didn't uh, fund Groovy anymore, it took a little while for OCI to come to the rescue and, and at least ensure there's um, some uh, one working some of their time at least on, on Groovy and you can see with OCI's impact and after we got over the Apache tax impact we're now back at a pretty healthy state and it's uh, pretty consistent again. So that's kind of like what's the story from all those charts? Well you know if you go and speak to some Kotlin people whatever they'll tell you Groovy's dead or whatever well no Groovy's just quietly achieving things in the background getting stuff done getting stuff out there and it's just it's just uh, working its way through. We've, there's been a few little road bumps when we first joined Apache to, to get things moving. The, the whole uh, module support in JDK 9 is a, is a it's not designed as so, something that uh, is meant to be easy for dynamic languages. So our flow typing is, is not compatible with the way the module system was designed and we've had to sort of work around that. And we're, we're just coming out of uh, all of our rework to get all that working. So that's yet to come out, but, but, but it's um, all looking good. Over and above all that, there's now additional ways. So I encourage you to contribute to Groovy. We could, you know, even though as those, I'm saying there's uh, good numbers of contributors and releases, we'd, we'd actually like that chart to go up. So feel free to keep con con uh, contributing to, uh, to Groovy. We're um, very welcome for any contributions you can make. And that can be across anything. So if, if you uh, don't feel up to diving into the core code straight away, have a look at the doco, have a look at some tests. If just um, do a few blogs and things. We've got a session a bit uh, later on that uh, if you're interested in contributing, how you can uh, do that a bit more effectively. Um, another, there's now the Groovy Open Collective. So this isn't officially part of Apache. Apache have got a policy of we don't do code for cash. And what, what that means is you can, you can sponsor uh, Apache and they will put that money towards their infrastructure and so on. But what they don't do is accept a big swag of money and please slip in all my changes that my company wants into your code base. They, they don't want any individual company that might be handing over dollars to influence what a community wants. So if the community wants things, take them from wherever they come from. Um, if, if the, uh, but, but they um, won't allow projects to accept cash as a, a thing that could potentially be officially or unofficially tied with what might be uh, uh, contributed into the code base. So they don't even want us to be feel like we're, because someone's, even, even if someone says that's like there's some cash that we're going to give you that's not tied to any code or anything, we might feel obliged, oh, there's some companies giving us a lot of money and um, they've put in some pull requests or we, we feel guilty if we don't accept some of those pull requests. So so that's a, that's a um, something that's, uh, Apache put in place when they had some very, uh, difficulties early on with that sort of thing happening and they're, they're very, very strong on vendor neutrality. And so we, we respect that and they allow us though to set up something that's independent. So as long as it's independent and it doesn't affect um, how the, the normal process of if you want to put in a pull request, you put it in and, and the community looks at it and says, is this something we want in the language uh, and so on and, and they'll um, decide independently of anything else that might be going on whether to accept it. The Groovy Open Collective has now got, uh, um, and I know some of the people in this room, thank you very much, uh, but it's now a way that anyone can, can help, help along, get there's some, some money there that's available for us to, to boost certain areas in Groovy and other things. It it's not just Groovy, it's, it's other things in the, in the Groovy ecosystem. So um, this has helped us get Groovy 3 support in Eclipse. It's not final, but we've got some, a really good first uh, stab at that. It's helped us a lot getting rid of the illegal access errors. So um, there's more to say on that, but it's, it's, it's really helping and it'll help us uh, further down the track. So keep that in mind. 
And let's look at the roadmap. Okay, there's one and a half hours of content for 2.5. Most of you are probably familiar with that. So that, I'm going to skim through that pretty quickly. And then I'll try to come back down and look at the stuff that's in 3 and what we're hoping to, to do for Groovy 4. So Groovy 3, just to give you, for those who um, don't want to wait around for, well, I know you're hoping no one's leaving the room, but if, in terms of your brain power, you don't want to uh, wait around to what's, you want a bit of a sneak peek. We expect to have maybe one more beta of Groovy 3 and then some RCs. In a f so in a few weeks' time, you'll, you'll see a beta, and then a few weeks after that, some RCs, and maybe in a few weeks after that, final. So Groovy 3 is not, not far away, and I'll uh, talk a bit what, what's left if, uh, if I've got time. Groovy 4, as soon as we do an RC, for the first RC for Groovy 3, we'll do a branch on the code base, and we'll put out some Groovy 4 alphas. And um, I'll sp explain what's in those in Groovy 4 on, uh, at the very end. So quickly, some of the things that are in um, 2.5. Um, I guess I should ex explain the context for, for quite a f for some of the stuff, and the same will uh, this this little spiel applies also when we get to some of the Groovy three stuff. Um, Groovy has a very close tie with Java, so we want it to fe feel comfortable to people in Java. So what that means is. Um, what we take is Java, you know, we, we look at Java code as sort of the base, so we want to support stuff like this, and we want to take away boilerplate stuff and add in a whole lot of good stuff. So every time there's a new release of Java, we've got to reassess, okay, there's new stuff that's in there, does it make some of the stuff we do irrelevant? Can we, can we uh, deprecate some stuff? Is there new stuff we need to support? And so on and so forth. So that, that sort of is a theme that um, comes up with some of the uh, features that I'll just quickly skim through. And that's, that's why you might think, haven't that, hasn't that been around for a while? Well, it, it, it may have been, but the, the scene might have changed as, as Java's evolved and we've sort of tweaked things. So some of the stuff that's um, been coming out in Java, even from Java, Java 8, is, uh, we had to sort of catch up with and so on. So repeated annotations. You can, uh, the, in Java bytecode, you cannot have the same annotation twice. But you can do a little trick by having an array of those annotations, and you can have a single array of annotations with multiple annotations inside. And so you used to have to do that manually. Both Java and Groovy now will, if they, they'll automatically do that, uh, putting things inside the container for you automatically. And they'll understand the things that are done that, that way. Method parameter names. If you've ever looked at the at bytecode or tried to debug stuff, you might see things, uh, if you haven't got the source for a, a file, you might see, Things like arg0, arg1, arg2, and so on as the names of uh, parameters. Um, in JDK 8, you can put on a switch on the compiler to have mean meaningful names in there. So if you could do that in the past if you had enough debugging information and so on. There was ways to, to get it back. Um, now you can embed that in the bytecode, and Java and Groovy do, do that in the same way. Uh, annotation in more places, we'll, we'll see a quick slide on that. and. Um, it might, yeah, we'll see an example of that um, a little bit later on, I think, in uh, test testing frameworks for JUnit 5. Running on across JDK 9, 10, and 11. In 2.5, we're expecting that to have warnings. We did a tiny bit of work to reduce some of the warnings in 2.5, but most of the work is in, in 3, and that's gone a long way, and it's, uh, it's very, very close now. Uh, and we're repackaging things uh, in, even in 2.5, that are transparent to, to you. So things like um, default Groovy methods have, might have been put somewhere else. You won't notice that. The, the old ones will be there and deprecated. The new ones are in a different spot. But you, you don't, they're automatically um, enhancing your, your classes. You won't notice that they're done. So some of the stuff, getting ready for split packaging and so on, is um, happened in 2.5. So there's some examples here of repeated annotations. I won't go through those, showing you how you can get to the uh, arg parameters and things. Groovy works the same as Java in these, in these places. This is the annotations in more places. So you can have a read-only map of uh, a type that extends existing files of, uh, and also uh, non-negative integers of sizes. So that's what the map is. It's mapping from files to integers. You can have a, a, st a string array of non-null, non-empty, read-only items. So this is something that um, Java's got hooks for, but there's, at the moment, things like non-negative and so on, uh, the Java compiler and so on doesn't know anything about those. So it's starting to know about uh, non-null, the, the Java compiler, 
Um, well, there's a lot, mo most of the support in Java doesn't do anything with these annotations. The same is currently true for, for Groovy, where Groovy obviously has a lot of its own uh, annotations, but that's one of the things that we're going to be looking at in Groovy 4 is turning on more and more support in that space. So we'll see that a bit later on. So there are the modules. I, I talked about some restructuring of stuff. Um, on the, the blue ones are the modules that are in Groovy 2.4 that mo many of you are familiar with. The green ones, the extra ones we added in 2.5, and then there was more tweaking happened for, for Groovy 3. Groovy, uh, Groovy YAML is an, op is an optional model in, in uh, Groovy 3, and there was a thing that we, Groovy JSON Direct, where we were, it was a slight optimization for uh, JSON parsing, where we were peeking inside, privately peeking inside strings and stuff. Um, it, that was very fragile, and we've basically deprecated it. And with all the, the new stuff that's just built into the JDK, um, I, I don't think anyone's going to notice that performance. But if it's still there in 2.5, if you need it, and um, you can, so you've still got a mechanism to get to that stuff if you want. One of the other things, so, so Groovy, obviously, it's this extensible language that gives you a lot of metaprogramming capabilities, runtime and compile time. AST transforms is one of the big features of the compile time metaprogramming. So this is ways to extend the language that the compiler understands about and happens all at compile time, so there's no uh, runtime performance hit. And um, this is sort of showing you a little bit about the, the background of AST transform, how they work. Who knows how AST transforms work? And who, who, would, uh, who doesn't know much and would like to know more? There's a little bit, okay, well this, I'll go through this really quickly. Um, on the, the left-hand side, there's a little class and it's got, it's called athlete, it's got a name and nationality properties and one method. That gets converted to bytecode. Or it gets, oh, when it's getting compiled, it gets converted into a, a representation uh, by the compiler called the abstract syntax tree. So it's just a, if you've got data types for your customers and you've got lists and maps and so on, there's data types inside the compiler. That's the abstract syntax tree. It's, it's a tree structure representing your program. So you'll have a class node, and inside that class node there'll be field nodes, property nodes, method nodes, and things like that, constructor nodes. Um, when you, in uh, the, the compiler goes through multiple phases. In the early phases of that compilation process, that tree is fairly anemic. So it's got a few things there, but not a lot of information. So somewhere, if you've got a public static void main string array uh, string, in the very early phases of compilation, there'll be a thing there for main, and it'll say it's public and static. But it won't know, when you say, it, it'll know there's a string array args, but it won't know string is actually Java Lang string at that point. So it doesn't know much. And what happens is, as the compiler goes on, it's finding out more and more information. Oh, string. Oh, yeah, I've seen that before. That was Java Lang string. Oh, this other class. Yes, that's the one I compiled earlier. And it starts fleshing out more and more information and putting more and more stuff in there. And eventually, um, You'll, you'll have a class that has getters and setters automatically added in with stuff if you're using properties and so on. So what happens is more and more stuff happens. By the end of the compilation process, the little tree is fully fleshed out into a big tree that'll look like that. Okay? Uh, AST transforms lets you participate in that process. So there's a process that happens there automatically by the compiler. The AST transforms allow you to manipulate how that process happens. So you can do really powerful things that are uh, writing huge lines of code and so on uh, as the compiler's processing. So if you put at two string, it's just a little annotation that you're putting on your class here. Somewhere along the, the phases of the compiler, that gets tr triggers off a little uh, extra step that adds in a two string method into the, your class. So there's a little AST transform called the two-string AST transform. And it just all it does is adds the two-string in and puts in all the code for two-string based on what all the properties and fields are of that class and then any other configuration that you've put inside two-string. Here we didn't put any extra things. So that gets added in. And the end result is as if you'd written that two-string yourself with all the appropriate lines of code in it. Yep, makes sense. And that might seem like a fairly trivial thing for two-string, but in bigger cases like immutable classes, that's all the, uh, that's all the code that you would uh, have to write in Java, and that's what you'd write in Groovy. So AST transforms are all about, let's make it more productive and fun for you by taking 
best design practices, good uh, implementations of things, stuff that's full of boilerplate, and let's put it all away inside an AST transform. And you can have a declarative style of programming. So you just declare things as immutable. It'll put best practice immutable things inside that class for you. And it, your class is much easier to read. If you're, if you're, deb you're debugging this and you see that, you say, oh, that's an immutable class, I know that. Whereas if you see this other one, you're going to look through, well, it's got some of the stuff that an immutable class would have, but is it some other variation? And you have to go through it all and, and, and assess. You, so it might be a comment somewhere that says this should be immutable, and then you notice there's a setter somewhere. Did someone add this in and not read the comment? What's going on here? And it, it, it's hard to sort of fathom that out. Here there's much less scope for things to go wrong. And similarly, there's, there's, there's tricky code if, you, if you're ever using lazy uh, res, uh, resource uh, management. You, they might have resources that are expensive to set up, so why bother setting them up if you don't need them? There's lots of tricky rules for, do I use double-check locking, and if I'm in multi-thread environment, do I use the, uh, some of the other idioms if I've got a static res, uh, resource and so on? Um, you can go code all those, you can go look up the, 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 the patterns books, the, the uh, best practices, do a bit of Googling, find a bit of code to steal from somewhere. But Groovy just says, yeah, just put lazy there and then you can put lazy static or lazy volatile or whatever, and it'll give you the best practice for the particular scenarios that you're after. So uh, they're the kind of things that um, AST transforms are going to give you. That's by way of background. The blue stuff are the ones in Groovy 2.4. The green ones are the ones in 2.5. So you can see there's quite a lot of uh, new features that have been added. I won't really have time to give uh, justice to most of these, but I'm just going to quickly skim through some of them. You can see there's a couple more happening in uh, Groovy 3. There's ways to embed your Groovy doc inside your, your uh, bytecode file, and ways to make the Groovy doc appear in your ASTs, if, so you can make your transforms do things with it. And there's some null checking. So if you want to automatically null check all your uh, method parameters, constructor parameters, there's, there's features of that coming in 3. Let's look at the stuff in 2.5. Uh, again, I'll just quickly skim through some of these. Some of these are um, hopefully reasonably self-explanatory. As well as all those new ones, we've revamped a lot of the 2.4 ones as well. So you can see there, uh, there's a whole bunch of them got improved or, and reworked. So what we'd noticed was, over time, um, We'd add in new features in one of these transforms, but we wouldn't add them in another one. So we went and consolidated all of that and tried to put the same features that make sense across all of the different uh, transforms. To, so to give you a feel, there's the uh, tuple constructor transform that's in 2.4. All the blue ones were the, f the uh, ways you can config using that annotation in 2.4, and the green ones were all added in 2.5. And that was to actually align it with things that are now in map constructor and were in immutable and were in other places in canonical and so on, but weren't directly on this one. So they're now all aligned. If you go and use one versus the other, you'll have pretty much the same config options all the way through, wherever it makes sense. The other thing that happened, and it's worth uh, understanding this if you get some weird error message that you're not expecting, canonical and immutable are now meta annotations. So what's a meta annotation? You can declare an annotation to be a group of other ones. And there's two ways to do it. You can say this one is just a list of other ones. And you do that using this sort of notation. You can just have a, an annotation collector. You, that's an annotation you put on one of your meta annotation. So my meta annotation is canonical here. And I just give it a list of all the other annotations that the canonical is actually um, the, the meta annotations that it represents. So as, during the compilation process, whenever you see canonical, canonical, it pulls that out and puts the other three there. Simple. Um, there's a might slightly more sophisticated, there's just using some examples, all the parameters that you'd expect all get parsed down to the uh, constituent transforms here. So you can see cache there got passed down to two string and also equals and hash code because it makes sense to filter it down to both of those and so on. Immutable actually went to this. So what we found was that Immutable did some really useful stuff for us, but people kept saying, oh, I really love Immutable, but I've got this special use case where I need this slightly different feature. And I've got this, and, and Immutable was just growing to become this big monster. And it was getting harder and harder to uh, allow it to be everything for everybody. So what we've actually done is just split it up into a whole bunch of constituent pieces, and you can now mix and match from all those different pieces. Okay, so um, there's a whole bunch of different things there. So you can just, just uh, 
decide here, okay, I don't need all the things that are immutable, but I need a few of the bits and pieces. And so I'm going to go get a mutable base, which does a, a bunch of stuff. You can read the, um, the, the, drive, the Groovy doc for, for that. I'll get property options, and I'm going to pull out the immutable property handler stuff. And then I'm going to do canonical. So it's like canonical, but it's going to do a little bit of immutable stuff. And this one here is going to actually going to create immutable-like classes with only one constructor. So there's, no, there's none of this uh, map constructor stuff, no multiple constructors with uh, different sizes that are automatically handled. Just give me one constructor. And that's, that's really handy if I'm doing some sort of um, uh, spring injection or something, and, and I'm using, or using, using some sort of dependency injection container that's expecting only one constructor to be available. So we could have tried to make the big fat immutable handle that case as well as handle other cases, but, but you can go mix and match, and you can, you can uh, do this yourself. Immutable also now handles other things like the new date and time capabilities. Um, here's an, just another example of using immutable. One of the things that's split out in that, um, in that list of immutable things there, one of the things that you can see in that list there is uh, property options. We can override that by supplying a, and, and property options takes a property handler. Okay. We, and it's, it's got a, there's a default one that does all the things that Groovy normally does. And when, when, when you use that, Groovy, if you, for instance, p pass in a collection, Groovy will use the normal built-in Java stuff for making a, a um, non, uh, it, it wraps it around and won't let, it won't let you mutate it, okay? It does all the things you'd expect. But that's, a, that's using the, the um, stuff that's built into Java, which some people like, some people don't. If you don't like it, you can go and write your own Guava immutable property handler, and you can go look up the, 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 the implementation of that is uh, in this uh, slide, in, in the GitHub site for this, for this uh, talk, if you want to go and see how you do that. So this will, do, this will now create immutable into all the things that Groovy does, but it's using an immutable property handler. Now it'll be Guava's immutable libraries that would get used. So if you pass in a collection, it'll get wrapped using that particular library. But you can, you've got control now. You can go and uh, tweak these things. Immutable handles, optional, other things you'd, you, that you'd expect. There's a lot of property name validation. So you might have code that was uh, working in 2.4, you thought was working in 2.4, past the comp compilation process. Um, it may not have actually been doing exactly what you uh, thought it was doing. You might have misspelled uh, some of your property names and so on. Um, so f uh, oh, this one here. So I'm excluding... Uh, what I really should be saying there is exclude the first name property, but I've just done first. I've maybe I renamed something and didn't uh, fix it up everywhere. Maybe I just mistyped it. Um, that will compile in Groovy 2.4, and you won't know that you've got this wrong unless you're observant enough to go and look at the um, the two string and see that there's, there's the first name is appearing in there when you th and, and and it's not respecting what you thought was exclu that exclusion. Um, you may not notice that. In uh, Groovy 2.5, that'll actually be a compilation process now, and it'll tell you that, yep, that first doesn't exist anywhere, and you'll know straight away. Th uh, this is related. Remember I showed you that example? I talked about that example where I wanted a um, dependency injection-friendly uh, version of Immutable. Um, the, one of the features that enables that is, in that case, you don't want to have... Gro Groovy has a way of doing uh, default handling of all of the parameters in a constructor. And what it does is if you supply no parameters, it'll automatically supply the, uh, the first parameter. And then if you, um, well, if you supply all the parameters, uh, it'll automatically pass those through to your constructor. If you leave off the date, there'll be a default date. If you leave off the third one, which is the two port, it'll supply a default, null two port in this case, and so on and so forth. Um, that's really handy as a, as a feature with the, the, how the default parameters work, but again, for that dependency injection scenario, it's not what you want, so anyway, that, all that's configurable. There's now pre and post conditions on top of constructor. So what I can do is um, do a bit of validation or slight manipulation of the data that's coming in as, as part of the uh, construction process. So what people were telling us was, I really like this auto construction stuff, but I can't use it because I need to do this little tweak. 
and therefore I have to do everything by hand. Isn't that a pain? So this lets you, in a, in a controlled way, have just a, some tiny little tweaks that you can put in, and all the rest of the code is uh, the automa automatically generated stuff. There's, again, things can be tweaked that you couldn't be tweaked before. So I can make, uh, I'm going to create a tuple constructor for person, but I'm going to make it a private one. And then I might have my own factory methods where I'm calling the private constructor. And, and you, you'll have to go and use uh, the, uh, the make person factory method if you want one of these. But I just didn't want to write all the code for that constructor. So I get, I get it, and it's private, and I can make use of it. There's a map constructor. Um, if you actually need to uh, have a map-based constructor in the, in the bytecode, um, this is a good thing to use. If you have, the, uh, um, if, you're, if you're familiar with how Groovy does um, named arguments, if you, have, if you use the, the, the map constructor, the named argument syntax in Groovy, it calls the noarg constructor and then calls some set property things. So it does a little bit of a trick under the covers for you. It does that automatically. Um, if you're trying to interact with Java, uh, that might not be the, the best kind of interface that you want. So this lets you roll it out in a controlled way, and this would let you do things like make all your... Um, if, if I'm using the noarg constructors and then the setters, I can't make all my uh, fields final. And if I want to make them all final, this will do it all in the one hit inside the map constructor. And that, so that's one, one, one place where you might want to use it. There's an auto-implement. So Groovy's got a whole lot of ways to create dummy objects. This is, these are great for testing. And um, so I can go and just have a... Uh, I've got a map that's got one key, has next, that returns a closure. And I can just say, yep, I want to take this and treat it as an iterator. And it happens to be an iterator that's exhausted because it's always going to return false. And that might be what I need in my particular test case or something. I don't need to go and create an uh, exhausted iterator test class. Okay? So Groovy's got really good features for creating. These things are really handy in many sort of testing scenarios, these sorts of things. Um, but this is all dynamic sort of flavored code. There's now an auto implement that goes and uh, fills in dummy versions of all the methods inside there. And that, so these are real methods in a real class that gets uh, created, and this is now a sort of a static way to do all those things. And you can use that from Java if you want. So uh, it's, it's a complementary feature to a strength that Groovy's had in, in that sort of testing space. And that's just showing you how to, to, make, to make use of that. And th you can get auto-implement classes that have, in, in the early ones, I, I had um, returning faults and null and sort of, sort of default parameters. I can make things that throw not supported operation exception or something, whatever I want, uh, and things like that in, in this auto implement as well. So all of that's configurable. There's an auto final. So uh, um, a lot of people like to put final on all their parameters, all their uh, constructor parameters and so on. Um, that can be a very, very useful coding practice because it can make sure that someone doesn't write sort of obscure code that goes and changes things that people aren't expecting to change. So that's, that's kind of nice, but it does sort of clutter up all your code. So just by having an auto-final auto uh, thing here, it'll basically put final everywhere, and you don't need to have it in your code, but you'll have that, um, that practice um, in place. And you might not think you'd go and use this uh, directly. It, you may not, but this is, the, this is one of the things that you might want to put in. So if you're using the meta annotation stuff, you might combine this with your own company's canonical and it'll just automatically happen in all, all of those uh, in your company-wide. So what I, sh what I didn't, maybe, maybe it wasn't obvious, when I was talking about canonical and immutable, now these meta annotations, if you've, if you, as, as an organization, you're working in, in a project or a customer site that you might be working in, um, if you don't like the immutable annotation that, w that comes out of the box in the language, you can make a corporate one with your own tweaks. Okay, so that's the whole point. You you can go and make one, and then everyone, everybody who uses that meta annotation inside your organization will have all of those facilities. Okay, so that's showing a bit more about final. Uh, del there's a slight tweak to delegate. If you've ever, uh, you can put delegate on uh, fields on properties. You can now put them on uh, getters. Named pram and named variant. I've, I struggle with uh, explaining this in a short amount of time. I've only got a short amount of time. I'll see how I go. 
if I want to write a named uh, argument in Groovy, if I use the tuple form, I'll have types on all my parameters here, and obviously all my code will will I can I can make it uh, compile static. I can get type checking happening, and all the uh, checking is going to be uh, happening throughout the code that I write here. But because I've used tuple, you can't use named arguments against that particular constructor uh, or method. This one's a constructor. Now, I can just go and have a noarg constructor and then have setters. Uh, that's all fine. Um, but um, when I'm in the noarg constructor, you wouldn't have this, this uh, content anymore. And uh, some people want to have the map on there explicitly and have things like the final uh, fields that I was explaining. Basically, you would have a lot of work to do to, um, if you wanted, you'd have to go and write yourself a map-based constructor and a tuple-based constructor and get one to call the other if you wanted to actually get type safety in the code that you write, as well as giving people the option to use the named parameter feature in it for, a, or for a method or for a uh, constructor. Named variant now allows you to do that. So you just put named variant here, and this will automatically create the map-based one. Yeah. So what it means is you write the tuple one, all the code that you write is going to get the full power of uh, type checking uh, amenable to it. Users will only potentially see, uh, I've made this one public, but I could even make this one private. The, um, yeah, there's, there's ways to, anyway. The, oh, no, 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 I've, I've made this one private, but I'm making the uh, map one public. So the users of my class will only see the map-based one, but all the code that I write is fully, can have full, full, full type checking available to it. Over and above, so that's a good plus just there. Over and above that, this uh, parameter information is now embedded in the map-based constructor in the definition. And so your IDE can now actually, uh, when your users will be using the map-based one, it's now got information to actually do full type checking on the use of this constructor as well. So if someone's calling your method or constructor and they're supplying an R that's not an int, your IDE can now warn you that, that uh, that's uh, a problem. So both you as the writer of your classes have got full type checking and the users of your class have got the ability to full type checking. You need an ID that is aware of this, which is still coming. In, it's, so the Groovy compiler knows about it. IntelliJ uh, knows somewhat about this, and, over, and Eclipse knows somewhat about this. Over time, there'll be more and more uh, features like that. So, th so this allows more sort of type checking stuff uh, to be happening, and it's all embedded in the code and, and, and so on. I've got to find a way to explain that in one minute instead of four, four or five minutes. Anyway, I'll, I'll keep practicing. Uh, there's an, uh, enhancements to Newify. So Newify was a way you could leave out the new keyword in, in, uh, or use it in a slightly different way. There's now um, a regex variation to that. Macros is another thing, uh, another uh, sling in the bow of our compiled time metaprogramming uh, toolkit. And again, I'll uh, just, some of you, hopefully most of you will have seen, seen this. Um, if I was writing, I talked about those AST transforms before. As a user of those transforms, uh, you don't need to know what magic's going on behind the scenes. But whoever was writing those AST transforms would typically have to write code that looks like this. And this is directly using all the data structures the compiler knows about, the abstract syntax tree data types. So I'm using, I go class helper dot make date, and then that sets aside inside the compiler, it now knows about Java util date. Oh, that's a class that's, uh, that's come from the JDK and it's got these methods in it and so on. Um, I'm creating a new return statement. I'm creating a new constructor call expression. I'm going to supply empty arguments and, and so on in, in this case. So once you're familiar with those data, like any new API that you're going to use, once you become familiar with the Groovy's built-in AST data types, 
this isn't hard code to write, a little bit of boilerplate there. And Groovy is all about removing boilerplate. So the macro facility allows people who are writing those transforms to use Groovy. So the code, you just put in any Groovy code in here, return new date, and it automatically converts it to that code. So now when you you can go, this is trying to make AST transforms get closer to being able to be the sort of uh, VBA for, for PowerPoint or Word or whatever. Um, you'd expect users to be able to write that sort of stuff. We wouldn't expect users of Groovy, all the, the, the large volume of users of Groovy to all be able to write this sort of stuff, but we're trying to get it to the point where as long as they know Groovy code, they can write these transforms themselves. We're, I don't think we're there yet, but this is a really good step forward in, in, in that direction. When, you're, when, you, when this uh, magic conversion process happens, when this gets converted back to that, sometimes you've already pre-calculated stuff. So I might have already pre-calculated some variable x. And so this is using, all, this is using the full uh, blown versions from the from the compiler's data types, and this is the macro that I want. I want this to get v converted back, but here I don't want. I've got, I want something that I've already done to appear in here. So there's a little escaping mechanism to say stop expanding and converting it back, and just put this. I already know what's supposed to go here. Put this. Put this there, and so that's what the um, these, the placeholder notation is there. Okay, this is showing you some, some other uh, variants. You can, uh, you can actually have a, uh, a macro class that's going to... Uh, so so for, these, for this example here, inside the macro here, there's uh, an expression. You can either have an expression or a statement. Oh, this is a statement. You can have an expression or a statement that can appear inside here. Uh, that's the default when you're using macro. If you actually want a whole class, there's a special notation for, for whacking in a whole class there. Okay, don't, we don't need to worry about the, the details that are going on inside there. A complementary feature, once you start using these macros stuff, is this makes it super, super tiny to write the code that's going to go inside one of those transforms. But quite often, remember we, we had that abstract syntax tree that was there, and we were going to augment it and make a, a new, shinier one. Yes, the, the new shiny bits I can now write in really compact form, but working out where in the tree to put the new shiny bits, I still had to use the old code, finding stuff, oh, I've got to walk down the tree, here, go to my class, find the methods, go find the parameters, now I'm going to add my little shiny bit that I can use with my macros. AST matching allows you to do the same trick for a matching process. So you can actually say, oh, please go and find anywhere in my code whatever one plus one gets converted into, okay? Now go and replace that with two. So this is at compile time, gonna look for, so this one here is using just one expression, one plus one. Every time I see one plus one anywhere in my code, I'm just gonna replace it with the constant two, okay? So this is an, I can do this, this is an optimization that the compilers do, and this is typically the kind of thing that you get in a C compiler or something, it'll do these kind of uh, constant expressions. If it'll check that it's that both expressions are constants, and if they are, it'll just replace it with, it'll calculate that at uh, compile time and replace it. So, so that's uh, typically the kind of things you can do with this AST matching. Okay. Once you have this macro facility, what are some of the kind of things that you can build? Someone's gone and built a little mac macro called match, and this basically gives you uh, pattern matching-like expressions if you, uh, in, in Groovy, just by making that uh, macro available. If you're familiar with Spock, it's got a really nice facility for uh, putting your test expectations. You can now do that in your production code as well as your tests. So someone wrote a do with data, little macro. So you have a do with data and you, you put this little uh, information inside here and it'll just expand that out to the, to the uh, equivalent multiple lines of, of code that are there. So really nice facility. It's very early days with, with macros. We're still ex uh, exploring and understanding the kind of things that um, we can achieve with them, but there's uh, lots of nice stuff happening. Tool support got improved. So uh, Groovy Doc supports JUnit 5 out of the box. In the 258 and in beta 2 of 3, it's actually got even further improvements. So you'll actually be able to, 
in, go, get, go get a snapshot version if you want to try this out, or pull down master or the, uh, the head of the 2.5 branch. And you can now um, use things like Quick, which is a JUnit 5 based, uh, property based testing uh, library. And that'll just order, that'll be, that's a library that'll automatically run in the Groovy console or, or via Groovy now, as it'll recognize that. Spock 2, automatically run inside the latest versions of Groovy 2.5 and 3. The, the snapshot ones. In a few weeks' time, there'll be new releases, and you can you can try those out. Some improvements for for Groovy Shell, you can do grab and things like that inside. We've got some other ideas for coming in in Groovy Shell. Um, stay tuned for those. Groovy Console got a little bit of a, a little slick paint job as well. It's got a horizontal layout, and so instead of having the one above the other, you can put them side by side. This was some some data scientists people that are start getting interested in in using Groovy. I've been putting in a whole lot of uh, feature requests, and we're encouraging that. Um, so we, th we think that's a good um, area to to, to um, make work well with Groovy. Log to file also came from from those people. Uh, context menus was something that we've added in the Jane at five support. I already talked about at the Hacker Garden. We there was another few handful of uh, additional enhancements that may or may not uh, see the light of day shortly. We'll see how we go. We've uh, made some progress. So there's a potential loop mode. There's some additional context menus, some cleaner config and stuff to, to make those tools a bit slicker and, and uh, nicer going forward. We'll see how that uh, pans out. OK, there's extension methods. Uh, the default Groovy methods or extension methods are um, there's a whole bunch of them that you probably use and don't even realize you're using them. There's an initial one called tap, which is like with but returns the original object. And there's uses for both of those. That you can go and look at the, the different, uh, some, sometimes you actually want to return the thing, the result of the closure that you're calling, sometimes you want to return the original object and do a sort of piping nature. If you want the piping nature, you can just go dot tap, dot tap, dot tap, and it just keeps passing the original object uh, along the chain. So there's some nice things there. And across a bunch of all of the other tools, um, bit of a slick paint job as well. So CLI Builder, lots of really great improvements in the, the Pico CLI based implementation. So in Groovy 2.5, you can use Pico CLI as your underlying CLI library underneath CLI Builder. You can also use the, still use common CLI. You can pick whichever one you want. If you go use the Pico CLI, you'll get a whole bunch of extra features that are only available if you're using that particular one. And things, things like you can get pretty messages, you can get auto completion, uh, uh, bash script um, auto completion and stuff like that for all your parameters. Um, CLI Builder supports annotations as part of that. So you can use old school, very, very dynamically looking code, or you can use uh, annotations now. So you can get more um, scripty looking code or more type checking uh, variations depending on uh, what you're interested in. So improvements in the Jaxby and Jason and, uh, and a bunch of other places. You can, you can go and have a look at that. There's improved uh, static type checking. There's more tuples and a bunch of other stuff. So a lot of, lot of nice features there, but let's get on and uh, talk about the next huge slab of features. So there's another hour talk uh, that uh, sh should do justice to this topic, but we're going to skim it really quick. Uh, the Parrot Parser. So those of you who are not familiar, Groovy's parsing technology in, uh, in uh, 2.4 and uh, 2.5 is based on an old Antler 2 parser that hasn't been maintained for many years. And the pressure is on to change things, and it's getting that parser is quite brittle. There's bugs in it that we know about that are never going to get fixed. And uh, forget any support for JDK 10, 11, 12, and all the rest for, 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 for that kind of parser. So it's all been revamped. That's the good news, and we'll, we'll have a look at that. Um, part of this is making sure that we're keeping code friendly to people who are familiar with the new features that are in, in later versions of Java, and part of it's new stuff that, uh, that um, well, that, well, that's the, uh, you could call it catch up with Java, or you could call it assimilate Java, depending on how uh, your um, particular, uh, whatever turns you on, whatever, if, you, if you get a, uh, a, a little bit of uh, sadistic uh, pleasure in uh, assimilating all of all of Java and Groovy, then maybe this is the right way to think about it. I'm not sure. Um, better module support. 
Okay, I'll talk about some of the stuff in there and better documentation support. So let's whiz through. A lot of this stuff I'm, I'm sure most of you will have seen, so do a, a, a quick whiz through it. The do while loop, we didn't use to support it because it uh, complicated how we'd handle closures, now supported. Parrot looping, there was one variation of the classic for loop that had the commas that we didn't use to support, that's there now. Inside a for loop, you couldn't use the, there's a special syntax for multi-assignment that you can just use if, if in, in a um, single line. That can now be inside a for loop. Java array style initialization. In cases, so we used to say, no, nah, go, don't ever use the curly braces for array initialization. Use the, use the square braces and you can leave this bit out and we'll auto, if you put int array over here, we'll work it all out for you. Um, if you're cutting and pasting Java code, you had to go and keep changing all those little things. So now, in, in, for cases like this, where it's unambiguous what what's the intent is, the, the new parser just handled all that fine. Uh, equals, uh, so Groovy uh, subverts double equals here to, instead of being reference equality, it's, it's um, object equality or business equality. So because we take over that and make that to be equals, if you actually want to do reference, we always had is. Now there's the identity and the non-identity operators. To it. So you've got shorthands for all the different things you want. There's nice shorthands for if you want the negated versions of instance of or in. It saves having extra, you know, you, have, you always have these multiple layers of brackets with knots and all this sort of stuff. All that can just go away. You've all probably seen the Elvis operator. We've now got Elvis assignment as well. Again, use it, use it sparingly if, if your code starts looking a bit cryptic, but it, there's some places where it is actually uh, really neat to, to be able to use. We've got uh, safe, um, if you use question mark dot in Groovy, that's the safe referencing operator. There's safe uh, indexing as well. If you put the question mark in, in, in front of uh, an array index, a list index, then um, if, if that array happens to be null, the whole expression will return null. Um, better support for try with resources. So in Groovy, there's some options that are probably better than Java's try uh, style. But if you're cutting and pasting code, we'll now, we'll now support all the different flavors, including all of the, um, the stuff that's even the Java 9, uh, where you can uh, have a pre-declared resource and just do a try of that resource, all of that sort of stuff supported. So all of that's just basically catching up with Java syntax, if you like. If you need it, you can just open a curly brace, close a curly brace, and put code in here. And if this is inside a method in a place where it can't be interpreted as a closure, so you don't put x equals in front of it, instead of being a closure, this is, this is just a nested block inside your code. So you can de declare variables in here, and then you can use, when you step out of this block, this, this will be, um, well, this is not defined here, but it could be like a parameter if it was mentioned further up. This one here, um, and, well, yeah, you, you understand nested context. You can have as many of those as you want. Again, probably not going to use it very often, but if you need it, it it's handy to be there. Okay, there's um, uh, var support is now there. And it, at the moment, it's a direct alias for uh, def. Okay. If you, and it's um, not a keyword, it's a reserved type, just as it is in Java. So if you already have def var equals something, so uh, short for my variable or something, that's not going to confuse the compiler. It's not going to say, you use the, uh, uh, there's a, some new keyword here and it's going to cause confusion. Um, it'll all be fine. You can start using it. This is one of the things that we have to finalize. There's been talk about actually making var inside compile static slightly different and making it a bit more Java flavored. And that's why, uh, come and talk to me later if you're interested in that. That's one of the things we need to wrap up and finalize before, um, before three goes out. I'd well, we, we need to know exactly what we're going to do going forward for that operator. And um, there's, a, yeah, there's, there's, op there's options for us to handle that. Lambdas. So all your Lambda expressions that you've seen in Java, just carry them all across into Groovy and they'll all be fine. All the different shapes, parameters with and without uh, brackets and all the, all the different variations. So anything that you would do in, uh, in Java, you can, you can bring all the different uh, variations across. Yep. Method pointers. So 
this is a feature that's been in Groovy since very, very early days. Um, if I've got a, a class and I take a static method, say integer, and I've got two hex string, I can just go integer dot ampersand to hex string, and that becomes a method closure that's actually pointing to that method. So when I call my closure, it calls that method for me. So that's really handy. I can, I can now treat this as a closure and do closure type things with it. I can use currying, I can use memoization, composition, all the things you do with a closure, and that's really handy. Um, what we've done, uh, it, but if you, if you had a class target and an instant method, instance method, that, didn't that wasn't really very meaningful. It, it actually created a method closure for you in, in Groovy, and uh, if you ever tried to use it in that particular scenario, it didn't really make sense. You'd get a me missing method exception unless you went and curried it or did something with it. Um, so we've actually uh, plugged that hole with the semantic equivalent of what you're going to get with method references to be discussed next. So you can now go file equals file dot ampersand new, which is the constructor, or you can go uh, file dot n is hidden, and these are in fact instant methods of file. So they, it actually creates method closures with an extra parameter where the parameter is the instance that you're going to work on. Yeah, which is actually what method reference is going to give you. And so you can now go assert is hidden file dot git, and if I'm in a directory that has a dot git directory, it'll say, yep, that's a hidden file in that directory. Make sense? So there's a, a slight, a new, new shiny bit that actually makes it consistent across all the different things. And guess what? Put colon colon there, and all that's still going to work, and that's how, what you would be doing in, in Java land anyway. Um, so that's all good. I'll explain a little. I've got a slide coming up um, that's going to explain the how that gets implemented, which is important. Uh, let's get to it. Um, you, there's a couple of slides here with examples. I'm going to skim over those. You, you've probably seen the, this kind of method reference um, all over the place in stream-based code. You can have dot ampersand or colon colon. That's all fine. You can use, yep, if you want to make a, uh, create yourself a reference to the constructor for a two-dimensional string array. You can do that if you want, and then you can go and fill in the, the two-dimensional string array. And you can use it with your own classes as well. Now, how does that get implemented? Well, if you just go, as if you had dot ampersand here and you printed out what upper was, it would tell you that it's a method closure. That's what the default out of the box is if you use method references. So it's slightly different to what Java is going to do. But what that means is if you start using this, you get something syntactically equivalent to what Java gives you, but it's more powerful. So it, this is actually a closure. I can now go use curry, I can use memoization, I can use composition everywhere, um, and still use the Java syntax for method references. So I'm doing something much more powerful than what Java can give you. But because it's a closure, there's extra overheads and a bit of extra memory and, and stuff. So you may not want that. Um, well, so there you go. There's Big to add, I'm going to curry five. I've now got something that um, uh, adds five to things. And I'm going to memoize at least 10. So it's going to cache the results. And if I call five plus on big integer three, I'm going to get big integer eight. Or I can pass in five plus and I can pass in 4G and it'll come back with 9G. Yep. So that, that's all good. But if, if you uh, don't want that extra flexibility, You've got something that's slightly more overhead and um, not quite as fast as the Java equivalent. So if you put this inside compile static, I've got string to lowercase inside a compile static block, and you print out what it is, you'll actually get a method reference of a uh, lambda here. And this is the exact equivalent of what Java would give you for that same code. Yep. So if you want to get the speed of Java, you want to get the same uh, it's going to get the same JIT optimizations as Java. Go stick it inside compile static, but don't expect to use any of the extra bells and whistles that, that you get uh, the rest of the time. And you, you can go and look at the bytecode for this, and you'll see it's using invoke dynamic with the method handles and the Lambda meta factory and everything. So it's all the exact same code that uh, Java would give you in that particular scenario. So what's the long and short of all of that? Um, if you need the speed, and you, and you want to have the Java-like code, go use compile static. And if you, 
inside, if you're already using compile static but you don't want that, you can just, just go use the, the .i ampersand version. The .i ampersand version goes back to the existing behavior. So you can use, pick, pick the double colon if you want the, the Java-like one, the, the .ampersand if you want the, the traditional behavior. Default methods in interfaces is uh, something that uh, we support using traits. This is one of the other things that we need to finalize. I believe we can actually push this through as is in three because it's not going to cause any binary uh, compatibility issues if we go and change this uh, in a 3.1 or in a four. But we've got to make sure the whole community is happy with that. Illegal access warning errors, a lot of these have gone uh, many of them have gone in, in beta 1. Uh, so everywhere where you're using reflective code, so the Groovy, uh, if you run the Groovy test suite on Java 9 for 2.5, you get thousands of errors. So every, everywhere where we're using reflective code, um, the, the new module system just doesn't let you do it with flow typing enabled, which is what, what, what um, Groovy's got. We've now put in nearly all the hacks. Last time, Daniel, was, he ran the test suite. He's got a, one or two pull, extra pull requests that uh, tweak things. I think he's got down to five errors instead of thousands. So there's just a few little cases that uh, aren't handled yet. So he's done a magnificent job. So you can, should thank him uh, if you ever get the chance online or uh, if you ever get to, to, to meet him in person or on forum somewhere for all the work that he's done. It's done a great job. Um, you can go and fire this up and you, you can go and... Um, Fire up the Groovy Shell, Groovy, Groovy Console, inspect your ASD, do a whole bunch of stuff and you won't see any warning errors anywhere. There's still cases where you will see them um, that are still left in there but not hardly any and we'll hopefully remove those over time. If you do actually go and do access a private variable, you're still going to see one of those warning messages. So it's up to you to, at the moment to decide if that's what you want and whether we can find a way to actually turn that off in the future is something that we need to go have a look at. But for now, all the normal Groovy usage is, is covered, and when you go and do those things where you're actually peeking inside things that Java would think is, is, a, is a bad style, you're still going to get one of those warnings for the, for the moment. We're still looking at what we can do there. Split packaging. The module system requires that no two classes in different packages have this, uh, in different modules have the same package. So if you have Groovy util XML Slurper in the Groovy XML module and a Groovy Util something else in Core or a Groovy Util um, something else in JSON or in something else, it, uh, they won't, you won't be able to use those modules. So what we've done is made a copy of all the affected classes with, the new, with a, re a new name, a new package name. So Groovy Util XML Slurper is, is, is now a copy Groovy XML, XML Slurper. Okay. You can use either one in Groovy 3. All of the ones that are not compliant with the module system are deprecated. So you may get some warnings, uh, deprecation of warnings, but you can still use it exactly as is. So all of your code will still compile as is in Groovy 3. In Groovy 4, we're planning to delete all those deprecated classes. So you've got the whole lifetime of Groovy 3 to move your stuff across. That's the message. Uh, we have to do this. We, we, it's a breaking change. We knew there was going to be a, um, a big mess somewhere. Module system, it just requires us to do this. So, but this strategy that we've got allow, gives you a whole version of Groovy to, to do that change. But there's a caveat on that. You can't necessarily mix and match. You can't move... A, uh, if I go use um, XML node printer and I use the Util, util version of that, it's going to expect to print the util, the, the, the deprecated nodes. So the deprecated utility class is expecting to de use the deprecated nodes. If you convert one of those over, you've got to convert the other one over. So when you're moving things across, you don't necessarily need to move everything across all at once, but often related classes, you'll need to move all of those over at once. And usually, moving it over just is usually uh, one import, and that's it. None of, the code, none of your code needs to change for any of these the, this, this split packaging renaming. You might have some imports. Now, we're still discussing, do we give you a tool to automatically convert your stuff over? We may still do that. We haven't written it yet. 
we've been uh, just using the structural search and replace in IntelliJ and it's been working really well. We what, maybe we'll just publish what we've been using, I don't know, or maybe we'll write a tool, we're still... But that might not come in 3.0 perhaps, that might, we might defer that to a 3.0.1 or something. So that's something that's, uh, that's coming. Um, I won't go through all of the packages there. There's a list, it's all in the release notes. If you want to look ahead of time, go, go look up the release notes and, you, and you'll see it there. I briefly mentioned this before and it, it'll have to stay as that brief mention. There's now a, a vast improvement in the way Groovy doc is handled. So you can embed it, make it accessible from your AST, you can embed it in your bytecode, you, you, you've got options to turn all that on. Okay, so let's now looking to the future. We've got two minutes to look to the future of Groovy. Um, it's worthwhile to just pause very briefly and sort of uh, look at what's on the scene. So what's the new, what are the things that are currently uh, pulling on Groovy and saying this is what you need to do next? What, what are our users wanting? We've got new languages to go look at. So we can look at Julia and Kotlin and other places and go look at what they're doing. Um, there is uh, a huge, um, the fastest growing language, the fastest growing mainstream language at the moment, there's a race on between JavaScript and Python. Python's winning at the moment. So what are they doing right? Because all the, the data, there's uh, a lot of the people who put out big data libraries and Kafka library and all the, the libraries thought, oh, well, Scala's coming along, we get, we'll have to write Scala versions of all our APIs, and a lot of them did. And all the users just said, no, just give me the Python ones. I don't, the data scientists didn't really want to, the, um, overhead of all the types. So the types, we, we often feel comfortable with type-rich programs, but data scientists have said, we don't need that stuff, just give us Python and we'll be happy. So we should, we, we should um, take note of that and, and make sure that it, our Groovy is nice, it's got both the static and the dynamic natures. We should just make sure that the, we've got everything in the dynamic nature, that it makes sure it's all uh, clean and uh, shiny and, and uh, exactly what the uh, data scientists would want to use. We should keep that in mind. and. Uh, that we should uh, be aware of that. We, there's a lot of, um, uh, as I said, there's a lot of Python users and a lot of small, I, I turn up to conferences and old small talk users and say, I love Groovy, I, I really wish, I'd actually prefer to be coding in small talk, but that's dead and I love that Groovy's here and I'm, I'll be programming Groovy for the rest of my life. Keep up the good work sort of thing. And so we really need to tap in to, to the, the ethos. What is it that um, these data scientists who use Python what is it that attracts them to that? What, well, the small talk users that found themselves in a nice friendly environment that had all the things there, then everything they could go and uh, introspect and find everything that they wanted. We, sh we should respect that as well as the, 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 the pulls that are coming from, from the, 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 the Kotlin directions and Julia directions and other places. When we mix things in, I think we, we're doing a good job of uh, keeping things extensible. So if we're adding in new features, we should just keep making it ex uh, so that users can participate in that. I think there's nothing that we need to do there. And I think if we continue to do that, we're going to still end up with all the things that we love about Groovy now, but it's going to be uh, fun for even more people. Because there's a lot of people who are interested in using Groovy for things like data science and so on. We should make them welcome and make sure that we've got a, a language that's going to uh, uh, be catered for them. So with that in mind, one slide on uh, what we plan to do in four, and this is very much a uh, early day, so if, if your favorite features aren't in this list, um, uh, don't fret, and if there's not enough shiny new bells and whistles in this list, list, don't fret, we've still got our think caps on. There's some things that I haven't put on this list because we're not quite sure if we're gonna do them yet, but these are the things that um, uh, we're thinking of um, moving towards. So the split packaging stuff I told you, all the d deprecated classes, the duplicates, the, old, well, the existing legacy ones, they'll all get removed. That will make all the modules uh, module compliant. So in, when you use four, you'll be able to put things on your module path as far as split packaging is concerned. We've got other work to do as well in that space. And we were hoping to get Indie by default done for three. We haven't um, had the time to do all, there's some optimization things that we need to bring across between the two different implementations of bytecode. We're still very keen to get that done, but we don't want to delay three for six months while we get all that in place. So we're thinking of pushing, we've done a little bit of that already, but most of it's still to come, and we're thinking the bulk of that's going to happen in four now. There's more module support in four as well. If you want to go write your module info in, in Groovy, for instance, the, we can make the parser understand that. Switch, switch expressions and pattern matching other things might come. 
stream-based versions, so sort of uh, groovy integrated query or XML slurper with streams or even your own data collections, we might uh, put a bit of uh, uh, syntactic sugar over the stream stuff that Java's got. We don't necessarily want to go and replace all of that stuff, but we might uh, fill in some gaps or make some things a bit shinier in all that space. And because we've made the type checker extensible, we did that with it so that you could start doing things like getting support for non-null and a bunch of other stuff. So I'm expecting us to get a few of those things in place and have some more smart stuff. So if you've, if you've if, like Kotl the way Kotlin handles non-null, we'll be able to, you can be able to turn that on or off using some, some annotation stuff. Opt in if you want or don't. So there's some of the things on our list. We're keen to know what's on your list as well. So, so uh, please uh, keep, keep chatting on the, the, the mailing lists and forums in various places or, what, or at people in conferences and let us know what you're interested in. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, come in, I think we haven't got time for questions, but come and see me uh, anytime today, or I'll be, I'll be around uh, most of tomorrow as well in, in, in the city. Come and, come and chat to me.